and welcome to Noon Conference hosted by MRI Online. Noon Conference connects the global radiology community through free live educational webinars that are accessible for all and is an opportunity to learn alongside top radiologists from around the world. We encourage you to ask questions and share ideas to help the community learn and grow. You can access the recording of today's conference and previous Noon Conferences by creating a free MRI Online account. You can also sign up for a free trial of our premium membership to get access to hundreds of case-based microlearning courses across all key radiology subspecialties. Today, we are honored to welcome Dr. Lee Al-Halali for a lecture on MR neurography of the cranial spinal nerves below the skull base. Dr. Al-Halali is a neuroradiologist and currently director of neuroradiology at the Ivy Brain Tumor Center. Her research focus is on novel imaging techniques and focused ultrasound in brain tumors, but her clinical love has always been on skull base anatomy and pathology. The desire to see more and know more has led her to pursue high resolution imaging of the skull base to help to vi visualize the anatomy she has grown to love. Dr. Al Halali also has a deep passion for open access education, and you can follow her on Twitter at Teach Play Grub to learn more from her. She believes there's no greater impact she can have than using education to help other physicians take excellent care of their patients. We couldn't agree more, Dr. Al Halali, and are thrilled you're here today to share your expertise. At the end of the lecture, please join her in a Q&A session where she will address questions you may have on today's topic. Please remember to use the Q&A feature to submit your questions so we can get to as many as we can before our time is up. And with that, we're ready to begin today's lecture. Dr. Al Halali, please take it from here. Thank you so much. Um, it's really an honor to be here and I really wanna thank um, MRI Online for inviting me and giving me the chance to uh, share uh, some of my love of anatomy and advanced imaging with all of you. So today I'm gonna to talk about MR neurography of the cranial spinal nerves below the skull base. I have no disclosures. I long for a day where I have a long list of wonderful disclosures of people paying me much money, but not today. So when we're talking about MR neurography at the skull base, the first thing we're gonna talk about is the technical considerations. The cranial nerves are different than all the other nerves that we usually image with traditional MR neurography techniques. So you need a special technique to be able to visualize these incredibly small nerves. It's just like, you know, if we're talking about the brachial plexus versus the skull base, you're not gonna have the same, you know, traditional imaging of the shoulder as you will for the brain. So the same way you won't have the same imaging for the brachial plexus MR neurography as you will for the neurography at the skull base. Then one of the big uses of MR neurography is for pain syndromes. And I'll talk a little bit about how I use that to basically help diagnose difficult and atypical facial pain syndromes. And then finally, some advanced uses of MR neurography is actually to help our skull-based neurosurgery colleagues to better plan skull-based surgeries. So let's first talk about a little bit of background. So let's talk about peripheral neuropathy. They're actually a very heterogeneous group of disorders. The way I look at it is the nerve is kind of the connection between the spinal cord and the muscles. Uh, the same way a bungee cord kind of connects you between the ground below and a cliff. And many things can interrupt you on your way down. Um, trauma, tumor, compression, infection, um, in, you know, radiation therapy, many things, anything that interrupts your travel from the top of your hill to the bottom uh, can possibly cause disruption of the nerve and a peripheral neuropathy. But yet, despite having an incredibly heterogeneous group of pathologies that can cause a peripheral neuropathy, they actually all look very similar when we get down to EMG studies. Um, I, I kind of like to compare it to doing MR spectroscopy. You have tons of different pathologies when it comes to MR spectroscopy. But in the end, the spectrum all looks like decreased NAA, increased choline. Similarly, there's this very diffuse spectrum of peripheral neuropathies for which you really kind of get only two basic findings on the EMG, which is the myelinating and axonal pathology. So we really have a gap that needs to be filled in helping to diagnose these disorders for our clinical colleagues. And, and this is where MR neuropathy comes in. You know, the same way MR and the traditional imaging can help you differentiate, you know, all these different pathologies the way a spectrum can't, you know, imagine if you had to diagnose all your brain tumors just based on an MR spectroscopy of the lesion, it, it would be impossible. So the anatomic imaging has 
an incredibly critical role in the diagnosis and care of these patients. So traditionally, cross-sectional imaging could only demonstrate a mass compressing the nerve externally. But with the continued advance of MR techniques, we can now actually look for intrinsic pathology in the nerves. I like to use the analogy of it's like going from, you know, basically like a like periscope, right? Just lets you see that there's something there versus a microscope actually being able to look inside the tissue and being able to see the intrinsic pathology um, inherent in the nerve. So how do we do that? So I like to use the analogy that it's kind of like MR neurography is for nerves the way MR angiography is for vessels. The whole purpose is to basically get rid of the background noise and the background signal in order for you to be able to visualize the nerves. So they're very different techniques from a you know, MR physics standpoint, but luckily for you, it's not an MR physics lecture. But the point is that you're using the same principle of nulling the background so that you're better able to see the object that you're looking at for or are concerned with. So MR neurography, you wanna look at the nerves, just like MR angiography, you wanna look at the vessels. So let's talk about how we do that. So, similar, so as I mentioned, similar to angiography, we want to null the background in order to be able to see the nerves. So traditionally for larger nerves like the brachial plexus, we did this using first a fat saturation technique um, to get rid of like the bones, the subcutaneous fat. Um, and then we would do a black blood technique to remove the signal from the vessels. So that basically all we are left with are the nerves and you know a few uh, small lymph nodes. Unfortunately, those type of techniques that work so well for large nerves like the brachial plexus don't actually have the spatial resolution to help us to visualize the cranial nerves at the skull base. So what we can do is we use a um, reversed steady state free procession technique. So everyone knows the traditional steady state free procession technique, which is the Fiesta imaging, which we use to look at the cranial nerves inside the um, cranial ball. Now we just reverse that technique to be able to look at the cranial nerves outside the cranial ball. So um, the Siemens uh, name for um, the Fiesta imaging or steady state free, free procession is FIST. Um, so they just literally reverse the letters. It doesn't stand for anything. They just literally reverse it. And so it's called a PSIF. So I guess we're lucky that GE didn't invent it because that would be called a ATSIEF uh, or reverse fiesta. Um, so so it's, it, it doesn't actually say anything, but it's literally just a reversed steady state pre-procession sequence. So our protocol to look at the um, cranial nerves at the skull base is we use the 3D PSIF sequence. Uh, we do it on a 3T because we need to get incredibly small spatial resolution and we need to keep our times reasonable because we don't want the patient to be moving. We use a 32 channel head coil. It doesn't get as good deep penetration into the brain, but a lot of these nerves are relatively superficial. So a 32 channel head coil will help save you on time and won't decrease your uh, your image quality for the superficial nerves. Uh, we do 0.5 millimeter isotopic voxels um, and on a 3T Phillips scanner, that turns out to be about a six and a half minute acquisition. All of the images we look at on a 3D separate workstation in order to make multiplanar and curved uh, multiplanar formats of the nerve. And then in addition to our PSIF sequence, we also um, do axial T1 weighted images and coronal stir images. Um, in order to look for other things that may be causing um, peripheral neuropathy. Remember, it's, it's not always intrinsic pathology, right? We're at the skull base. There's still a lot of perineural spread of tumor. So you want those T1 weighted images to be able to make sure your fat planes are all preserved around your nerves. Um, and then, of course, the coronal stir images are helpful um, to look for any sort of uh, muscle signal um, and the T1 weighted image also for muscle atrophy that may be a result of any sort of nerve injury. So we actually literally will um, trace the nerve on our curved multiplanar reconstructions to kind of lie it out along its course, um, the same way that many people in um, 
CD angiography will lay out the carotid along its course, um, which is really helpful because a lot of times you're trying to figure out if the nerve is thickened. So it's helpful to be able to look at the region you think is thickened next to a more normal appearing region, right? It's almost like a, a, a nascent, right? You want to compare the region of stenosis or enlargement for a nerve with a more normal region. So the big application of the uh, MR neurography of the skull base is basically for craniofacial pain syndrome. Um, the biggest of these is obviously going to be trigeminal neuralgia. It dwarfs any other um, pain syndrome in terms of the uh, population that has it. But also um, there can be um, glossopharyngeal nerve syndromes, uh, glossopharyngeal neuralgia, um, and of course occipital neuralgia is a big problem in the headache population as well. So some novel uses that we're trying to use to apply this MR neurography is for more untraditional pain syndromes. So um, vidian nerves, the cluster headache uh, syndromes, looking for pathology in the region of the vidian nerve because it has a more autonomic sort of cluster headache um, uh, symptomatology. And then one of the important things we're using it for is with our skull-based surgeons to help inform their operative approach. Um, being able to visualize the facial nerve for parotid syndromes, being able to determine if you have a post parapharyngeal space mass, which nerve it may be arising from. Um, and then, of course, just to help them counsel the patients about how close their tumor may be in proximity to specific nerves to help um, them better inform and make a better um, operative uh, decision. Um, and then, of course, we also um, have used it um, in patients where we're concerned about perineural spread of tumor, but for whatever reason, the patient cannot receive um, gadolinium contrast material. Okay, so let's talk about the big use of cranial skull-based uh, neurography, which is for pain syndrome. So to understand looking for pain syndromes on MR neurography, you have to understand what is pathologic in a nerve on MR neurography. What constitutes brain injury, or sorry, nerve injury. So I like to think of the nerves kind of like we think of vessels, right? So nerves are carrying information um, or sensory or motor to muscles, nerves, um, uh, et cetera. The same way your vessels deliver blood to your brain. So anything that's going to interrupt this delivery of information, the same way if you interrupt blood flow to the brain will cause damage to the end organ. Um, so in, in the case of nerves, it would be muscle, muscle atrophy. And in the case of um, a vessel, it would be the brain. So, you know, the, the whole idea is when you have enough damage to a nerve, you get end organ damage in terms of denervation changes of the region that it's supposed to be supplying. The same way you get end organ damage like a stroke if you decrease the blood flow enough to that region of the brain. So, so I really like that whole analogy of they're just delivery systems, the same way the vessels are delivery systems for blood. So the most common classification to um, MR for um, nerve injury is the Sunderland classification. Now, this is actually a pathologic classification for which we do have corresponding findings on MR neurography. So the class one, the most mild injury on the Sunderland classification is basically, it's called neuropraxia, and it's basically where it's some injury to the myelin. Um, it's like a punch in the face. It's like a nerve bruise is the way I think about it. So um, in terms of like the analogy in terms of vessels, it's kind of like, you know, a carotid plaque, right? Um, there's damage to the endothelium, right? That's how we got the uh, carotid plaque. But, you know, everything else is intact. There's still plenty of flow. Everything looks good. Um, so the nerve can show um, increased T2 signal, um, uh, you know, from edema like being bruised. Um, but there's no effect on the end organ, the muscle, because we still have plenty of, you know, the equivalent of flow, right? It's just nerve bruise. The next classification, class two and three, is when there's actual... Uh, disruption of the axon itself and the myelin, but the stuff around it, the perineurium, the epineurium are all preserved. And I like to think of that, it's kind of like a dissection. So it's not, now we've actually interrupted, you know, the endothelium, uh, but everything else, the media, the adventitia, that's still intact. So we've gone a step beyond just having, you know, kind of the like irritation inflammation, we've actually disrupted it. And for this, we can see increased signal and increased size. 
And because now, you know, the same way we're now starting to interrupt the flow, you know, it's not just a plaque where you actually have like a dissection that can be throwing you know, emboli, we will see end organ changes. Um, and so we'll see denervation changes in the muscle. So class four is when you actually have full disruption, but only the epineurium is intact. The perineurium as well is disrupted. And I'd like to think of this kind of like as a pseudoaneurysm, right? What is a pseudoaneurysm except, you know, essentially um, a contained rupture? Um, and this is essentially what it is. It's, it's a contained rupture of the nerve. So you'll actually see it focally enlarged the same way you would see a focal enlargement with a pseudoaneurysm. Um, and because, again, we're now disrupting flow, right? We're disrupting the flow of information. We basically ruptured the nerve. Um, then uh, you will see denervation um, in the muscle on MR neurography. Finally, the most serious injury is when you actually fully disrupt everything. Um, and you basically get an end bulb neuroma. Um, I think of this as kind of like thrombosis. You've completely closed it off, right? There, there's no more flow. Um, you can see, um, as a result, some Wallerian degeneration of the nerve distal to this point. And of course, because you've completely thrombosed and closed it off, you will also see the denervation changes uh, in the muscle. So let's talk a little bit about the um, specific um, nerves uh, that we look at and the pathologies that can affect them. So the big one, the overwhelming one, I would say 90% of the referrals that I get for MR neuropathy are for patients with trigeminal neuralgia and facial pain syndrome. So the trigeminal nerve is a mixed sensory and motor nerve. Um, it exits the pons, and then after it goes through Meckel's cave, it trifurcates into its three divisions, V1, ophthalmic, V2, maxillary, and V3, mandibular. So the ophthalmic division um, exits the superior oral fissure and then branches into frontal, lacrimal, and nasociliar branches. So I like to remember that because what's around the orbit, right? This is the ophthalmic nerve, right? Well, you have your frontal bone, right? Your forehead. And along the medial aspect, you have your nose. And on the lateral aspect, you have your lacrimal gland. So that's your three branches, frontal, lacrimal, nasociliary. And these regions um, innervate basically the orbit and the forehead, um, and, and that's where you get your sensation. So on MR neurography, we can actually see these nerves. So we can actually see um, V1 going through the superior orbital fissure. And you can see here on the images, we can actually see it branching into the frontal nerve and then the trunk that will give off the nasociliary and lacrimal nerves. And along the inferior aspect of the image, you can see the ocular motor nerve in this region as well. So when we're talking about pathologic processes that we're going to be looking at for V1, um, it's obviously in close continuity to sinus, so sinus infections can possibly um, affect it. Um, again, you can see perineural spread of tumor, especially for skin cancers that affect the forehead region. Um, it's really rare to get a schwannoma in this area. Next, we have V2. V2 goes out foramen rotundum and it enters the, the, it enters the pterygopelvian fossa where it gives off basically branches to the palate and the alveolus of the maxilla. Um, and then it traverses along the inferior um, aspect of the orbit in the infraorbital canal is the infraorbital nerve and then terminates in the skin there and basically provides sensation to the mid face. So on MR neurography, we are actually able to visualize the microanatomy of this nerve. So you can see here, we can actually identify the maxillary nerve going into the pterygopalatine ganglion. Um, you can actually see a little bit on this image, the um, palatine nerve extending inferiorly from that pterygopalatine ganglion. We can also trace out the inferior infraorbital nerve along its entire course. It is incredibly common to see um, facial uh, skin cancers have their perineural spread along the infraorbital nerve. And this is an example of one of those curved multiplanar reconstructions that we use in order to trace out the nerve over its entirety. One of the things that really made me fall in love with this technique was the amount of detail that you can see. On this, we can actually see the individual nerves to each of the teeth in the maxilla. Um, and I was showing this image actually to um, one of the neurosurgery fellows who works in the anatomy lab. And he said to me, he was like, this 
is what I see, you know, and um, it kind of reminded me of the, um, you know, scene in Jurassic Park where the paleontologist finally sees like, you know, the, you know, the, the dinosaurs come to life. It was like this, he's been working in this anatomy lab, looking at these cadavers, and now he gets to see everything he has been seeing on the cadaver in real life, in real people, and able to see the pathology affecting them in life. So again, similar to V1, um, the um, maxillary nerve close proximity to the sinuses can be affected by sinusitis. Um, malignancies of the hard palate, there's a lot of uh, minor salivary glands in the hard palate that have a tendency to be things like adenocystic and can have perineural spread of tumor. One of the things that we do get consulted on is if you have a fracture of the orbital floor that involves the infraorbital canal, um, then you can uh, cause injury to the infraorbital nerve and get um, paresthesias in that region. So looking for injuries of that nerve related to prior um, orbital blowout fractures. Um, and similar to uh, V1, it's very rare to have nerve sheath tumors. Finally, the mandibular division. Um, it provides sensory basically to the mandible, lower face, and also motor uh, to the muscles of mastication. So it exits out for, through foramen of valley. The motor branch is actually a very small branch relative to the sensory portion of the nerve. And then it gives off the orechotemporal nerve, the lingual, the lingual nerve, and then the inferior alveolar nerve. So the auricular temporal nerve is basically sensation around the temporomandibular joint and ear. Uh, the lingual nerve joins with the corda tympani to provide sensation and taste to the tongue. And then the inferior alveolar nerve is basically, um, it gives off some motor to the floor of mouth, and then is the sensation for the gingiva and teeth of the mandible. It exits finally out the front of the mandible in the mental foramen and then supplies sensation to the chin and lower lip. So we can actually see all of these branches. The trideminal V3 branch is actually the thickest uh, branch and, and one of the easiest ones for us to actually be able to visualize. So you can see here on this anatomic drawing, the auriculotemporal going laterally, and then the um, inferior alveolar and the lingual kind of looking like two like stick man legs going down. And we can actually see exactly what we see on the anatomy drawing on our MR neurography. So the lingual nerve and the inferior alveolar nerve kind of travel um, uh, in parallel with the lingual nerve going towards the tongue and the inferior alveolar nerve going towards the mandible. And we can actually see that kind of um, forked appearance um, that you see anatomically. Um, uh, we can see it also on MR neurography. So the things that can infect V3 is odontogenic infections extending into the um, inferior alveolar canal. Anything that injures the mandible can injure the inferior alveolar nerve and the inferior alveolar canal, so fractures, osteonecrosis. Um, I would have to say that one of our biggest um, referral bases is pain after tooth extraction um, due to injury of the um, uh, inferior alveolar nerve from tooth um, extraction from dental procedures. Um, Again, the um, gingiva is in very close contact with the uh, mandibular alveolus, and so um, you can definitely have involvement by um, uh, malignancies in that region, and it's, it is rare to have um, schwannomas. So here's some example cases. So this was a young woman who had five months of kind of difficulty eating and kind of chewing with paresthesias along her um, lower lip um, after a third molar tooth removal. And here you can see that the inferior alveolar nerve on the right is incredibly bright compared to the left. You can see it. It's not per se enlarged, uh, maybe a little bit, um, but you can see the difference in the signal between the abnormal right side and the normal contralateral side where the nerve is only you know, slightly lighter than the adjacent muscle. So this was a Sunderland type one uh, injury. This is another example. This was an elderly woman who had pain kind of over the left pretagus and cheek after a left first mandibular molar extraction. And you can see that we did a ton of imaging of her over many, many years. I mean, like, I think like we went down to like, yeah, like 1997, all the way up to like 2018, we were imaging her. She had this constant pain. No one could figure it out. We're even doing, you know, traditional MRs of the orbits and face trying to look for the source of her pain. 
um, but we could never find it. So finally, when we um, started doing this, the uh, ENT who had been seeing her for all these years was like, oh my gosh, I have the patient for you. We need to look at her. So you can see here that um, the, the normal inferior alveolar nerve, so that normal forked appearance of the lingular nerve, or sorry, the lingual nerve above it, and the, the normal inferior alveolar nerve. On the pathologic side, you can see that you have this thickening of that proximal inferior alveolar nerve um, with kind of very thinning, almost, it, it's very difficult to see actually the, the nerve distal to this region. Um, so this is essentially an end bulb neuroma. Um, and uh, uh, of the inferior alveolar nerve that was causing um, her pain. Um, the vidian nerve. So the vidian nerve um, is involved um, in cluster headaches. In fact, they used to be called vidian neuralgia uh, before they got more fancy names. So one of the amazing things is we can actually see the vidian nerve itself on these MR neurography images. So you can see here that um, the vidian nerve is the thin line going through the vidian canal right below, right above it. You see that line above it? That's the um, uh, that's V2 and foramen rotundum. So they're kind of like stacked. So V2 and foramen rotundum and below it, the vidian nerve. And you can actually see that on this um, anatomic image from a cadaver. You can see the thicker V2 on top and then the very thin vidian nerve on the bottom. But it's it's incredibly thin, but we can actually still see it with our MR neurography techniques. Okay, occipital neuralgia. We get a lot of referrals from the headache clinic for um, patients with occipital neuralgia. So the big nerve that we are really concerned about is the greater occipital nerve. The greater occipital nerve is actually the thickest cutaneous nerve in the entire body. It arises from C2 and basically goes along the posterior aspect of your occiput and extends um, over the top of uh, your scalp providing sensation. There's also the lesser occipital nerve um, and the least occipital nerve, but they are they're actually much more difficult to visualize uh, by MR neurography. We can see a lot, but we can't, can't, can't quite see everything. So here is images of the greater occipital nerve. Um, so this is just a sagittal image showing it um, arising from that dorsal um, ganglion of C2 and extending posteriorly along the suboccipital muscle to rise along the scalp uh, to, to provide innervation in that region. So you can see like when you do like the direct coronal, you can't always see it quite the entirety of the nerve. Um, so that's why we really do like to do, here's an example of that multi-planar curved reformat in order to lay that nerve out in its entirety and be able to see um, the um, entire length of the nerve and be able to compare thicknesses, signal among different regions of the nerve. So the um, occipital nerves um, can be um, affected by compression points. That's the most common uh, finding um, for patients with occipital neural neuralgia. Um, you can sometimes get occipital uh, region lymphadenopathy, but that's rare unless you have a skin cancer of the scalp. Nerve sheath tumors, relatively rare. Um, malignancy, also rare. So um, in clinic, they can target these with Botox. Um, they can actually do it just by clinical palpation of landmarks. Um, we also can do it ourselves um, as radiologists using image guidance um, with a CT or um, ultrasound. The important role that MR neurography plays in these patients, because the, they already know they have occipital neuralgia, is being able to identify that the um, disease is unilateral. Because if they are going to have decompressive surgery and they only decompress one side, but it's actually a bilateral occipital neuralgia, the patient won't be helped. Um, and it's very difficult to tell like if, if it's truly um, one-sided or not clinically because there can be a lot of referred pain to the opposite side. Another thing that we can help them with is if there is continued or recurrent pain after surgery, we can tell them if there's um, perhaps adhesions or you know, muscle hypertrophy that may have um, caused recurrent compression and they might need another decompressive surgery. We can also look for if they cause a post-operative neuroma um, on their own from uh, post-surgical um, injury to the nerve. So where does the greater occipital nerve get compressed? Where should you be looking for it? So the greater occipital nerve um, sits like a little pea in a pod between the multifidus muscle and the semispinalis spinalis capitis. So right in between those two, that sandwich right there, that, that, that fat is where your ox greater occipital nerve is and where it can be compressed. 
So what we are looking for when we're doing MR neurography of the nerve is oftentimes we may not see the compression. It can be somewhat positional related to the muscle position, um, but we can look and try to see if there is a difference between the two nerves and make sure that, that there is a symmetry to confirm unilateral disease. So you can see here that on the patient's right, it looks fat and thickens, right? And um, it, it's got a little pot belly almost, right? It's a very thickened nerve where compared to the very thin normal side. Um, so we can tell them that yes, there is asymmetry. It looks like it is unilateral disease and that will um, give them confidence that a unilateral decompression will be enough to um, help this patient. So I'd like to end on what we're really trying to push and use this MR neurography for, which is preoperative planning for our skull-based surgeons, for uh, skull-based tumors for, in particular. Um, we also want to use it for our ENT surgeons um, for parotid surgery. So the facial nerve is the you know, Achilles heel of um, uh, parotid surgeries. Um, injury to it can be um, relatively devastating uh, to the patient um, in terms of quality of life. Um, and it's the reason that a lot of times, you know, we don't want to do anything percutaneous in the product because we're afraid of hurting the facial nerve. So the facial nerve is predominantly for um, the muscles of facial expression. It comes out the stylomastoid foramen. It then gives off the auriculotemporal nerve um, and then branches into its two major branches, the temporal facial, supplying the temporal and facial region, and the cervical facial, which is the lower facial region. Uh, so we can actually see this branching. So if you look here at the top image, you can see, you can actually trace the facial nerve as it comes down out of the stylomastoid foramen and then makes an abrupt turn to give off that temporal facial branch and then lower down, it gives off the cervical facial branch as well. So these then divide into what we traditionally remember as the branches of the facial nerve, the temporal, zygomatic, buccal, Marjo mandibular and cervical. We all remember from med school, the Zanzibar by motor car, right? It's it's one of the few uh, med school mnemonics that's still useful, right? Um, you know, you ain't using the Krebs cycle anymore, so so it's good that something you memorized in medical school is going to be helpful to you. And we can see each of these individual branches, and not only can we see the branches, we can see the branches of the branches. So here you can see this trifurcation here of the zygomatic nerve along the um, zygomatic arch and malar eminence. Um, here you can see this very distal bifurcation of another branch of the zygomatic portion of the facial nerve. Here you can see the buccal nerve, and you can see here the same um, pitchfork trifurcation uh, that you can see on the anatomic images. You can also visualize on the MR neurography itself. So we are able to visualize the incredibly distal portions of these uh, branches of the facial nerve. So no matter how peripheral your lesion is in the parotid, we can see what facial nerve branches are near or what facial nerve branches it's possibly involving. The most commonly injured branch of the facial nerve in parotid surgeries is the marginal mandibular branch. You know, it's, it's kind of a forgotten branch, except when it gets injured. And we can actually visualize it. It's incredibly small compared to like the zygomatic portion, but we can still visualize it and even visualize its individual branches as well. So the big thing for the facial nerve is obviously the parotid, um, parotid um, injury from parotid surgery. And then of course the parotid tumors themselves may also um, involve it and have perineural spread of tumor. So the lower cranial nerves um, for skull-based uh, tumor removal is also what we want to be able to apply this technique more to. So we can actually see the incredibly complex anatomy at the skull-based, um, both the vascular anatomy and the cranial nerve in, uh, anatomy that is um, in that region of the jugular foramen in particular. So you can see here, we can actually see the glossopharyngeal nerve, um, and we can actually trace it along the styloid process, especially in patients who have Eagle syndrome. But again, um, it's an important um, 
nerve to be able to identify when they're doing um, surgery um, at, the, at the skull base, especially in the region of the jugular foramen. We can visualize the vagus nerve um, as well. Uh, the vagus nerve is much larger, a little bit easier to visualize than the uh, glossopharyngeal nerve. And not only can we identify the vagus nerve itself, we can actually see its individual branches. After the vagus exits the, uh, the jugular foramen, it gives off the auricular branch going posteriorly. We can actually see this as well and then trace the vagus nerve um, uh, down through the skull base. I will tell you that we have tried to trace the recurrent pharyngeal nerve. We, we, we did go for that. It's actually quite difficult just due to the, the respiratory motion. But at the skull base, we can visualize the vagus with, with extremely um, uh, good accuracy. Uh, we can also visualize the hypoglossal nerve. Um, you can see here, this is where it's exiting through the hypoglossal foramen, um, where it swings around to join the lower cranial nerves in the carotid space before moving anteriorly to the tongue. So you can see we can take it all the way on our curved multiplanar reformats from the hypoglossal canal out along around through the carotid space as it turns, and now it's going to be going kind of out of plane here into the um, uh, tongue itself. We can actually even visualize the sympathetics in this region. So we can actually identify the superior cervical ganglion in this region, which is important because, you know, we, 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 we talk about all these named nerves and we're all concerned about the cranial nerves, but there can also be a lot of morbidity resulting from damage to the superior cervical uh, ganglion. Um, and hopefully maybe, you know, as this technique becomes more commonly used and more commonly understood, this is the type of thing that we can look for when patients have a Horner syndrome, you know, can we actually visualize the cervical ganglion and damage to that region? So, so this is the thing that this, I, I just absolutely love being able to look at these images and feel like I'm looking at an anatomy textbook, you know, and being able to see these structures that I've always learned were there but had always had to infer um, a pathology with them, but now I can actually see them and identify pathology in them. We can even visualize the accessory nerve. Uh, this is incredibly important because the most common cause of damage to the accessory nerve is from um, percutaneous lymph node biopsies. So if we are able to help the interventionalist by pre-procedurally telling them where the accessory nerve is in relation to what they want to biopsy, that could potentially help um, uh, save a lot of unnecessary um, uh, iatrogenic injury uh, to this nerve. Additionally, um, one of the biggest causes of morbidity after a radical neck or even a modified um, neck dissection is injury to that accessory nerve and getting that kind of shoulder sag from the, the, the damage to the trapezius. So if we can better tell the surgeon ahead of time whether or not a sacrifice of the accessory nerve is necessary, is there involvement of the accessory nerve by the lymphadenopathy, that might help them to kind of, if there's no involvement, be very, steer very clear away from that region and possibly avoid uh, further injury in that region. So um, thank you so much for um, coming to my uh, talk. Um, I am so incredibly honored to be here. I just wanted to thank um, Z King Lee. He was one of the MR physicists who really helped us to get um, this uh, uh, sequence um, off the ground. Um, of course, my skull base surgeon collaborator, Andrew Little and uh, Griffin Santorelli and John Milligan, who are the ENTs who have invested a lot in both getting me um, patients and, and, and giving me clinical feedback about the, um, the, the accuracy of, of, of this technique. So, so they've all really helped to bring this to, to the clinical forefront. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks so much for sharing your lecture with us. If anyone has any questions, please put them in that Q&A box and we'll try to get through as many as we can before our hour is up. We've got a couple here that I'll toss out to you, Dr. Al-Halali. First, in class one Sunderland classification, are there T2 changes in the muscle or the nerve only or both? Yeah, so Sunderland, the type one, as I said, it's kind of like a nerve bruise, right? Like if someone punched you in the face, but they didn't break anything, right? So you'll recover. You, you still can have your modeling career ahead of you if you get punched in the face with just a black eye, right? They, they didn't hit your zygomatic arch. It didn't fracture. You know, you still have your beautiful cheekbones and everything. That's the way I think of Sunderland 
uh, type one injury. So, so there aren't muscle changes. So when you start to see um, any sort of muscle changes, you should be concerned that it's, it's above a class one type of injury. Any chance to assess CN4? So we, we um, are not really able to, to visualize uh, CN4 very well. It, it's, a, it's an incredibly tiny nerve. We can see it intracranially and we can see it along the, um, the course of uh, uh, the, the, the intracranial portion and along the tentorium, but we, we have difficulty visualizing it in the orbit. Um, it hasn't really been a big push for us because A, it tends not to result in, you know, like a, a facial pain syndrome um, that, that we tend to get these referrals for because um, it's a motor nerve. And then the injuries to cranial nerve four tend to be intracranial along the tentorium from that, you know, pressing on it from the tentorium. So, so it tends not to have pathology that's beyond the skull base. It tends to be more of an intracranial type of pathology. So we haven't really had requests for cranial nerve four, um, and, and, and we do have difficulty visualizing it um, consistently. Mm -hmm. uh, we did actually, I'll tell you, we did a cadaver. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and if you have someone laying that still for that amount of time, um, uh, we did a third cadaver head. Uh, you can see it, but, but it's more difficult um, in, in, in true clinical scenarios. What recommendations can you give if we are trying to achieve these results on a 1.5 Tesla? Um, I have to be honest with you. I don't, I don't think it's, it, it, it would work. Um, I think that the scan times would be too long um, for the patients to be able to tolerate it um, to, to be able to um, get the resolution that you need. And I think you would have a lot of motion artifact. So I would, I would just say that if you're going to do this type of imaging, you really need a, a 3T to be able to feel confident in your diagnosis. You know, um, there's a lot of, um, you know, um, artifacts that can, you know, make it very difficult to tell if like a, a nerve is truly injured or if it's motion. So, so you really need to have high quality images to be able to perform this well. This might be related to that last one. How can we perform the reverse Fiesta sequence on a 1.5 Tesla MRI? So you, so you definitely, you definitely can. The problem is that you're just not going to be able to get the spatial resolution to get, you know, that 0.5 millimeter isotropic coverage to get the entirety um, of the, um, you know, basically the skull base and, and then you have to extend it through the face as well for these nerves. Um, the, the time would be extremely long um, and, and, it, and it's difficult for patients to hold still. And because we're imaging things that are so tiny, um, little bit of motion can make it very difficult. Um, you know, it's not a easy sequence to um, simply, you know, pull out of a box and, and do, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, like, that's why my, my, my acknowledgments include our, you know, MR physicists, why we were scanning, you know, severed cadavered heads, it, there, there, there is, you, you do have to have a certain level of quality assurance, you do need a 3T, um, you do need the patient holding still, um, and, and you do need to be able to do those um, multiplanar curve reformats. I often do neck biopsy and FNC. What is the percentage of injury to accessory nerve by doing FNC or biopsy? It's like to fi fine needle um, biopsy. So, so, so it tends not to be, you know, really the um, a. If, if you're a radiologist, it tends not to be the radiologist who are doing um, a lot of the accessory nerve damage. Um, it's usually it tends to, because you know we're usually right um, in the lymph node, it usually tends to be people who are doing it percutaneously by palpation um, who may not be quite as accurate, um, but certainly the um, FNA uh, needles, the, the size of them are not um, usually associated with um, accessory nerve injury. It's usually when, when you're coring. Um, those, those, um, and, and unfortunately, sometimes you do need the core, you know, they, you can't get a diagnosis just based on the FNA sometimes. All right. Next one. I understand you acquire a T2 stir image and a black blood sequence to create these images. Do you do a subtraction of these sequences in order to create the final product? It's not a stir. It's actually, it's a, it's a T2 fat sot with a, with a, with a, with a black blood and it's, and it's all, um, it's all one sequence. So, um, for so so that's the sequence that we do for the brachial plexus, and it's actually um, on Philips. It's called Nerve View, so it's a T two with black blood, a T two fat sap with black blood. So it's not a subtraction image; um, it's all part of one acquisition.
Right. I knew- and I'll, I'll avoid talking about spins <laughs> and, and pulses and things like that. And but those never seem to uh, help anybody. But yeah, it's, it's all one. It's all one package. Um, great. I think this question says, can you add in small coils? Does that make sense? I don't. Oh, you mean, uh, can you, can you do it on like a 16, uh, or an eight channel, um, uh, head coil? You can, um, the time is going to be a little bit longer. And also the 32 channel head coil, this has better superficial, um, uh, image quality. So that's why we like to do the 32 um, head channel um, uh, coil, but but you can do it. And initially, um, we we when we were trying to set this this up, we were doing it with both. Um, I thought the image quality was better with the thirty two, um, but but you can do it with uh, with lesser um, and and get pretty good image quality. Which machine do do you use? Is it Siemens three T? <laughs> Uh, no, it, we, these are all these are all actually a uh, Philips um, and Genia, um, but um, I, I have to say that I think Siemens has incredible image quality, and I'm, I'm sure that the, that you can get you know certainly equivalent, um, if not better, um, image quality <laughs> using a Siemens system. Awesome. Well, there's one more question. Uh, I, I'm curious. Any advice for new neuro neuroradiology fellows in training? <laughs> um read as much as you can. Um, you know, I, I feel like like nothing nothing makes you a better radiologist than just seeing as much as possible. There is no such thing as a wasted study. Even those negative studies that you're annoyed with on call that the ER is sending you, they are teaching your brain what's normal. And every time you go through them, that's reinforcing your brain what's normal so that the abnormal stuff will start to pop out to you. So there is no better advice that I give to any radiologist, new, old, you know, about to retire. The more you read, the better you are. So, so it's all about, I say, get as much volume as you can. Awesome. Thanks so much for answering all those questions. And thank you for your lecture today and for everyone else for being here and asking those questions. You can access the recording of today's conference and all our previous noon conferences by creating a free MRI online account. And you can join us next week, Thursday, April 13th at 12 p.m. featuring Dr. Francis Ding for a case review live on head CT perfusion cases. You can register for this free lecture at MRIOnline.com. Follow us on social media for future noon conferences. Thanks again and have a great day.